Good evening. Welcome to the fourth and final class in our Freedom Basics series. You guys were all pioneers. And I really hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I have. And uh, my prayer is that every one of us has entered a new phase in our walk with the Lord, that it's just the beginning of some good things to follow. I mentioned last week that we will be repeating the Freedom Basics classes three more times, twice here at the Klein campus and once in the Woodlands. And our conference will be in September. I'm hoping that everybody who attended is going to register for the conference. And we will send out an email as soon as we have a page up for registration for the conference. Please try and be um, good faith bridgers and register sooner rather than later because we will have to put a cap on numbers because a room can only hold so many people. And we're expecting that we're going to burst at the seams. We will also send a message, uh, an email uh, to you with the dates of the next Freedom Basics classes, as well as the date for the conference. I will include for you the information of the conference in Dallas with Gateway. If you feel like God has begun something and the ball is rolling and you just cannot wait till September, I would encourage you, just take the trip up there and um, strike while the iron is hot. Don't wait for September if you feel that you need to do this now. Also, if you have found this to be beneficial, please share with your grow group and your family and your friends, uh, whether or not they are faith bridgers, the doors are open. This is not a faith bridge only event. We, in fact, we've had some ladies from some churches in the woodlands who've been attending. So please feel free to spread the love and invite anybody that you feel might want to uh, join us. The uh, recordings for these four classes will be on our website soon under Kairos. And when that is done, I think I'll send everybody another email to, to let you know that it's official and it's there. So you can catch up on the um, evenings you may have had to miss. Tonight is Pastor Dan's turn. I could go home and put my feet up, drink a cup of tea, <laughs> and just knowing that he's going to do it tonight was a great feeling today. Um, thank you very much, Dan, and I hope you get as much out of tonight as um, I'm sure I'm going to. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be here with you. You know, I, I really think we would be remiss if uh, we didn't take just a moment and say thank you to Tanya, because were it not for her, none of this would be happening. She really is the, uh, the engine, the initiator, the one who brought this to my attention and to the church's attention. So uh, please join me in just saying thanks to her. A little earlier, um, a brother uh, asked me, now, tell me again, what does the word kairos mean? And how is that associated with what we're doing here? Kairos is a Greek term, Koine Greek. Koine Greek is the language that was used to write the New Testament. In Koine Greek, there are two words for time. One of them is chronos, Chronological, it refers to the passing of seconds, minutes, and hours. The other word is kairos. And kairos does not refer to what you see on your watch or on a clock, but rather to a season of God's choosing. A time when God is ready to do a new thing in our lives. And uh, I think that is an appropriate name for what we are doing here. Uh, we are trusting, we are believing, we are looking for God to do a new thing, that this is a season when he is going to make a difference 
in our hearts and in our minds, in our relationships, and in our lives. I'm glad that you are a part of the journey. I've uh, enjoyed making it with you. Um, thankful for the gift of modern technology. I was able to be with you in spirit some two weeks ago from clear on the other side of the world. I was in the Philippines and uh, able to, to beam it all the way over there and uh, enjoy Tanya's good teaching. Before we jump into uh, this fourth lesson, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, we find ourselves um, grateful and amazed all at the same time that you would choose for us to have a new season. Uh, you're really under no compulsion to do that. Each and every one of us in our own way have turned our backs on you and have chosen to live disobediently, but nevertheless, your grace overcomes all of these things and your mercy and your compassion reach out to us because you love us. I pray that tonight as we look at various truths, including truths from your word, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher just as you promised and guide us into all truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I have entitled tonight's lesson, Division of Labor, or My Part, God's Part. When it comes to the healing of our souls, both entities have a role to play. God is the healer. We are the recipient of the healing, but that does not mean that we are passive recipients. We do have a role to play in the healing of our hearts and in the healing of our souls. Therefore, I think it is imperative that we understand how that labor is divided. Who exactly does what in this whole process? It's a legitimate question to ask if we are going to move forward. As I was writing this lesson and thinking about that term division of labor, I could not help but think back to a time when my girls were much smaller and they would be assigned chores to do, all three of them, and how they would get down to the most minute differentiations in what each was to do. For example, unloading the dishwasher. I'm going to do the silver. You do the plates, you do the, and nothing more. The silver only it would drive me crazy. Like, just get the thing unloaded, okay? Who cares who does what? Well, thank goodness uh, the Holy Spirit is not that nitpicky. He's not going to disqualify us if our understanding is uh, limited. That's a guarantee. Our understanding will be limited on all this. We are broken, sinful creatures. We're not going to see and understand things perfectly. But we are going to work to do what we can and to understand what we can to show ourselves approved, to show ourselves as serious students of God's word. It's important to know that there are some things that only the Holy Spirit can do. And then there are things that only we can do. And God is not going to do the things that only we can do for us. He has created us as uh, individual beings, free will beings, able to choose, able to respond to his overtures of love. He has not created us puppets or machines. The basis of a real relationship is the ability to choose, the opportunity to live in love rather than being forced. There's really no such thing as forced love. Love must always be voluntary. And so 
there are certain aspects to this journey that only the Holy Spirit will be able to do. And thank goodness he does and thank goodness he chooses to do them with us. But at the same time, we need to understand that does not relieve us of all responsibility in this journey. There are going to be certain things that we must do. So how do we begin to understand, imperfectly as it may be, how do we begin to understand the division of labor? Well, the starting place, I believe, is to first of all understand the big picture. The starting place is to understand the big picture. Before we can understand what is happening on an individual scale, we must first understand what is happening on a cosmic scale. It's kind of like reading a map when we're trying to go somewhere for the very first time. How frustrating would it be if uh, the direction we had was only, well, drive to the end of this street and wait, and then take a right, and then wait. And then you'll turn left here and go a little ways. I don't know about you, but I much prefer to see the whole thing first, to have an idea generally, okay, well, where are we going? Then we can back up and talk about the individual roads and direction we must go. First, want to see what's going on big picture. And the starting place for understanding the division of labor is understanding the notion of kingdom. Kingdom. As in the kingdom of God, which we read about in the scriptures, which we are going to be learning about tonight. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourself, now, what? Pastor Dan, I didn't come here tonight for a theology lesson. I didn't come here for a Bible lesson. I thought we were here to talk about healing and wholeness. And we are here to talk about healing and wholeness. But first things first. If we're going to experience the fullness of what God has for us, we need to experience a renewal of our minds. In Romans 12, Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds, the way you think. Far too long, far too many of us have thought in terms of, I'm ugly, I'm lazy, I'm worthless. I'll never amount to anything. I'm a bad person. These tapes, if you will, if you were born at least before about 1980, you'll understand about tapes. These tapes perpetually run in our minds, even when we're not exactly aware of it. Our self-talk that voice that speaks to us when we're doing something that we can do on autopilot, like cutting the grass or driving or taking a shower, suddenly these tapes begin to run and we begin to condemn ourselves and we think in terms of what somebody else has said to be true about us. Well, a large part of the healing process is replacing those tapes. It's not enough to merely resist bad thoughts. In fact, Rick Warren says that that is a futile effort to try and resist certain thoughts. For example, if I were to say to you, okay, for the next 10 seconds, I do not want you to think about purple monkeys. What are you going to think about? And how ridiculous would it be for you to sit there and say, I'm not going to think about purple. I'm not going to, no. Instead, replace that with something else altogether. And so we're going to be looking in God's word for some truths to replace the bad tapes and to be uh, an overall part of the healing process. And the starting place is to understand kingdom. What does it mean 
to be a part of the kingdom of God. The story of the Bible, believe it or not, can be summed up in a single sentence. Are you ready? God is building a kingdom. God is building a kingdom of redeemed people. God is building a kingdom of redeemed people for himself. That's it. If you were to take your big fat Bible, all 66 books, Old Testament and New Testament, and boil it down to a single sentence, God is building a kingdom of redeemed people for himself. And winding its way all throughout Scripture is this notion of kingdom from Genesis all the way to Revelation. There is a thread of kingdom building going on. I'll show you. You'll see the list down there of various phases of kingdom building. To begin with, the kingdom pattern was set for us at creation. Creation. You read in the first chapter or two of Genesis, God created and it was all good. It was the way God intended for it to be. Unhindered access to God. Adam and Eve could walk with him in the cool of the day. Uh, there was no barrier of sin. There was no loss. There was no death, no sickness, no pain. Uh, God had established his kingdom with humanity as his subjects and himself as the king. And it was perfect. It was all very, very good. But it did not take long before the kingdom perished. And that took place at the fall. When Adam and Eve willfully chose to disobey God, to do what they had been expressly told not to, to do. They turned their backs on the kingdom that God had planned and basically said, we want to establish our own kingdom. What they did not realize was that they had been deceived. Human beings are not capable of establishing our own kingdom. The one who actually became king when they fell was Satan. He began to rule our lives at that point. Jesus calls him the prince, the power of the air, king of darkness, liar, father of lies, murderer. God's perfect kingdom perished in that moment, but he wasn't done with us. He didn't give up on us. And a few chapters later in Genesis chapter 12, God promised us a new kingdom would come and he made that promise through Abraham. The first hint we have of the new kingdom to come is found in Genesis 12, 1, when God said to Abraham, I want you to leave your father's home, your country, and go to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and you will be a blessing to all peoples. That's sort of the first hint that God is throwing out there, that he's not done with us. We, we didn't obey in the first kingdom, but he's coming back to us. He shows us a prototype, if you will, of the kingdom to come in the nation of Israel. He forms the nation of Israel, and the emphasis there is on their chosenness. Not the fact that they became a... a uh, a political entity, a geographical reality, 
The most important thing about Israel is that they were a special people, a chosen people, a people that God was reserving for himself. That's what Israel was intended to model for us. That one day when his kingdom comes in its fullness, we will all be a part of his chosen kingdom. We won't have to fight our way in. For years and years and years after the establishment of the nation of Israel, the kingdom was prophesied and all of the major and minor prophets, major and minor prophets, all of those books you find pretty much in the second half of the Old Testament, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Nahum and Hosea and Joel and Zephaniah and on and on and on. All of those were men speaking on behalf of God, prophesying that God is not done with us yet. There is a kingdom that is coming. And finally, it did come. It became present to us in the person of Jesus. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but for now, suffice it to say that the long promised, the long prophesied kingdom of God was initiated in Bethlehem under a star visited by wise men and shepherds. That is when the kingdom began. That is when the invasion, if you will, began. No longer would this be ruled by the prince of darkness, but God was sending his son, light, to begin to establish a new kingdom. And since the time of Jesus, the kingdom has been preached and proclaimed by the church. That has been our job for some 2,000 years to announce to humanity, the kingdom is here. You don't have to wait until you die. It's not a matter of going to heaven. Heaven is not equivalent to the kingdom. They are not the same thing. The kingdom is not so much a place as it is a relationship. It is a relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, whereby we become his sons and daughters as we were intended to be. And the last book of the Bible tells us about how one day the kingdom will be perfected. The book of Revelation If you read the book of Revelation carefully, you will begin to see that our eternal destiny as believers is not in some far off mystical place that we typically call heaven. No, you and I are going to spend all of eternity right here on this globe, this earth. That's absolutely necessary because otherwise you would have to say God lost The devil won. He took over the world and he has claimed it for himself and God never won it back. But that's not what Revelation teaches. Revelation teaches that old things are gonna pass away and the new has come. That doesn't mean that this world is gonna be balled up and thrown in the dustbin. No, this world is going to be redeemed just like you and I are in the process of being redeemed. And one day we will experience the kingdom here on this earth just like Adam and Eve were supposed to. It's going to come full circle. God wins. He takes back what is rightfully his. So you see, from creation all the way to the very end, the kingdom is winding its way, the notion of the kingdom. And Jesus, in particular, was very, very clear about this. If you read the four gospels and pay attention to what you're reading, you're going to see that word kingdom over and over and over. I've given you just two verses that are indicative 
of Jesus' perspective on the kingdom, but there are many, many others. If you pull out your concordance, you can look them all up. In Mark 1.15, Jesus is announcing himself, proclaiming, I am here, and this is the way he does it. In verse 115 of Mark, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's saying the kingdom's here and I'm it. I am the initiator. I am the one who has brought the kingdom of God to bear on this broken earth. Those of you that were a part of Faith Bridge way, way back in the day when we were still at Cleb Intermediate may remember a very significant sermon that Ben preached. It was called, The Reason for the Season is Destruction. And in that sermon, he talked all about why Jesus came. He came to destroy the works of the devil and to establish his kingdom on earth. That's why he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is leading a revolution, an invasion. And he makes clear in John 31, 36, how we get into that kingdom. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We don't get into this kingdom with a passport or a visa or a green card or anything of the sort. It is through a relationship with the king. And when we have that relationship with the king, we are a citizen of the kingdom. Just before he was crucified, he told Pontius Pilate in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. He was not saying that it's not established here on earth, but rather it's not like any other kingdom you can think of. It's not like the Roman Empire. It's not like the Greeks or the Persians or the Medes or the Babylonians or any other kingdom that had been known up to that point or any kingdom since. No, it's a kingdom established in heaven that is coming to present itself on earth. So, Pastor Dan, you've told us all about kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. What on earth does that have to do with renewing my mind? What does that have to do with my healing and wholeness? Well, let's jump right into that under the section entitled, Our Part. The key issue for us in understanding what God is trying to do in our lives is a matter of citizenship. Citizenship. I mentioned to you earlier that kairos is a word which refers to a particular season, a season of God's choosing, a season when he does a new thing. Well, that new thing is made available only to members of the kingdom. Only those who have entered into a relationship with Jesus are able to receive this kairos, this work that Jesus wants to do in our lives. And we have to begin to understand ourselves as citizens of a new kingdom, thereby becoming recipients. We are able to be recipients. We are qualified to be recipients because we are members of this kingdom. In three different places, the apostle Paul hammers this home. First of all, in the book of Ephesians. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You're not like people on the outside. You are not like those who continue to live in rebellion. You are not like those who will not bend the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No, you have done that. Therefore, you are now a citizen of the kingdom. 
In 320, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is vouchsafed for us in heaven. That's where Jesus is. He's at the right hand of the father in heaven. And because our citizenship is based on relationship and not political standing, not geography, our citizenship is currently vouchsafed for us at the right hand of the father where Jesus prays for us continually. And then finally, Colossians 1.3. He has delivered us, uh, 1.13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I don't think it could be put any more plain. The moment we entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he plucked us out of the domain of darkness and placed us into his kingdom. The bottom line for all of this is, as a result of your citizenship, you are different. You are not the same. That is a truth that we have got to begin to soak in. What a New Testament professor of mine used to call a walking around verse. As a student of the scriptures, he would occasionally come across a a new insight, a new gem, a new little nugget of scripture. And it was his habit, once he finally realized that, to go on a walk and just think about that and mull that over. He called them his walking around verses. This is a truth that needs to be a walking around truth for each one of you if you are going to experience the fullness of what God has for you. As long as you think you are an outsider, as long as you think you are unworthy, as long as you think you are one of the bad ones or the lazy ones or the ugly ones or the no good ones or whatever it is you have been told by the enemy, there's no way you're going to be able to experience what citizenship gives you. Most of you are aware that I do a good bit of international traveling as a part of my work here at Faith Bridge. And over the last 11 years or so, I've been blessed to travel to the nation of India 15 times. Now, how many of you have ever, ever had an opportunity to go to India? Few of us. Well, uh, it would not be an overstatement to say that India is different from the United States. If you want to experience different then India is the place for you. I haven't been everywhere in the world, but I've been to a lot of places. I have never been anywhere like India. I suppose that's the reason I keep going back. It's just so bizarre, really. And I remember one day, probably on my second or third trip there, I was feeling very frustrated with the situation that I was in involving some Indians. We were not connecting. I was not getting through. They were not understanding. And it wasn't a matter of language. We could all speak English. But for some reason, we just could not figure one another out. And then, boom, it dawned on me. Okay. It's not just that you live in a different country. It's not just that you live in a different culture. As an Indian, as an Easterner, you think completely different about life than I do. West and East do not meet. And Eastern thinking is radically different from Western. I'm not saying one is better than the other or one is right and one is wrong. They are just different. And it was such a relief to me in that moment to realize, I'm not getting through because I'm thinking like a Westerner. I'm expecting them to be Westerners. I'm expecting them to be Americans. They are not. They are totally different. And they, of course, would have a similar experience were they to visit us. I've talked to several of my friends there who've had an occasion to visit the United States. And I'm always curious to ask, so what what did you notice? What stood out as being different? My friend Solomon was here a couple of years ago. 
He said, I noticed two things right away, Pastor Dan. He said, the cars, the cars. I said, what about the cars? He said, they all stay in a line. (laughs) And everybody stays in their lane. And everybody obeys traffic lights. And nobody blows their horn unless they are mad. In India, it is a free-for-all. You take your life in your hands when you go out on the road. They say you need three things over there to drive. Good horn, good brakes, and good luck. Not for the squeamish at all. I said, what else was different? He said, oh my goodness. I could not believe how clean it was. I did not see a single piece of trash on the ground. India is a a refuse dump. I, I have been very few places in India where there was not trash on the ground. And that's not a value statement. That's not a judgment against them. That's just the way it is. Trash everywhere. The current prime minister, to his credit, is attempting to correct that situation, to change it. But he was just blown away. My goodness alive. When, when, when you're done with a piece of trash, you, you people actually put it in a can. And it's removed. Completely different thinking. The starting place for our healing and for our wholeness is to begin to understand and accept, I am no longer a citizen of this world. I am no longer a citizen of the domain of darkness. I have been transferred into the kingdom of light and life. Well, how does one become a citizen? I said earlier, it's a matter of relationship, relationship with Jesus. But in order to have a relationship with Jesus, you must die. You must die. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then in what is easily the most comprehensive explanation to be found in the Bible of what it means for us to die in Christ is found in Romans chapter six. I share with you just a portion of it here. It is worth our time to read. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. That describes the symbolism of believer baptism. We go under the water, signifying our death, and we are raised to new life. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He took all of the brokenness and all of the sinfulness of humanity into himself and carried that to his grave. And all of us who identify with him, who hitch our wagon to his, who claim to be one of his own, we too in Christ have died. And just as he was raised from the dead, so we too have been raised from the dead. 
For now, it is our spirit that has been raised from the dead. Our spirits are made alive in Christ, our soul. But there is a day coming, and scripture is very clear, that one day, this will be raised from the dead. One day, this is going to die. I had a weird moment of thinking a while back. I, I had just awakened. It was early in the morning and Becky was still asleep. So I didn't want to move, make a bunch of noise and wake her up. And I was just lying there and I, I stretched and I looked at my hand and I thought to myself, that's been a good hand. It's been with me all along. But one day, that hand will be dead. It will no longer move. It will be gone. But one day, it will come back. And all the rest of me will come back to new life in Jesus Christ. You say to yourself, oh, well, that's going to be an awesome day. That's really when the fun starts. No, I'm here to tell you, folks, we are in the kingdom now Paul says, you have been raised to new life. Not you will be, you have been raised to new life. And it is on the basis of this new life and our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven that we are able to receive healing and wholeness. Healing and wholeness comes to members, to citizens of heaven the kingdom. What is our part? Our part is to be in relationship with Jesus. Our part is to begin to change our thinking. Our part is to begin to understand, I'm not who I used to be. I am different. Not because I have gritted my teeth and made up my mind, but because of the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is why I am different. Now, what about his part? Well, the result of our death in Christ is that we are no longer empowered by the flesh, but by the spirit. In other words, the life that we live is no longer energized and motivated, controlled and directed by our own desires, wants and needs, what the Bible calls the flesh, that sinful, broken part of us, that died, that's gone. And if we have been raised to new life, it is now the spirit who empowers us. It is the spirit of God who lives in and through us, providing for us the basis for our healing and our wholeness. In Romans, Paul says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So I say to you in Galatians, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Further down in Galatians 5, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is making very, very clear. We are not different in name. We are not different in perspective and outlook. No, we are truly, genuinely different. That old part of us, that sinful, rebellious part died and is gone. And that which has been raised to new life is now empowered by the Spirit of God. Jesus living his life through us. The question then becomes, well, how do I make that a reality? How do I live by the Spirit. I accept, Dan, the Bible teaches it. I get it, I understand it, but how does it become real in my life? 
In order to live by the Spirit, we must be filled with the Spirit. Paul tells us in Ephesians, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. If you have ever been drunk or you have ever been around a drunk person, the most obvious thing about that individual is that they are no longer in control of their faculties. They say and do things that they ordinarily would not. The alcohol has taken over. And Paul is saying, you don't want to be empowered by anything else. And he lifts up wine as an example of something that can control us, but it's not limited to wine. Our own selfishness, our own meanness, our own desire to get our own way, that's just as capable of energizing us as any bottle of wine ever was. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, in the closing moments, I I want to talk quickly about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And let me just put you at ease if you are afraid I am about to require you to speak in tongues or do somersaults over the chairs. That's not what we're talking about here. Speaking in tongues is one gift of the Holy Spirit, but it is not the required indicator that we are filled with the Spirit. Scripture says that if we are in Christ, we've been sealed with His Holy Spirit. Therefore, The key to the spirit-filled life is surrender. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul is saying our responsibility is to take our hands off the wheel and to present ourselves to God as living sacrifices. Heard a preacher say the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off of the altar. That's what we all want to do. We all want to be in control, but that's not the spirit-filled life. It's surrendering to the spirit. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Years ago when I was uh, in seminary, I began to do a lot of reading and thinking and praying and studying about this whole notion of being filled with the Spirit. And I saw that there were different perspectives out there about what that really meant. And I would hear testimony of people who would say, I've been filled by the Holy Spirit. My life has never been the same. I'm changed. I'm walking with God, so on and so on and so forth. And I began to have this nagging feeling that I was missing out on something, that I was, you know, everybody else was in first class. I was back in coach when it came to the spirit-filled life. And I went to a professor of mine and began to explain to him my conundrum and pour out my heart and said to him, you know, I, I want to know what do I need to do to get more of the Holy Spirit? And he said, Dan, I think you're asking the wrong question. See, it's not a matter of you getting more of the Holy Spirit. You have got all of the Holy Spirit you're going to get. The issue is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? What are you holding back? What is it that you are refusing to surrender? Boy, did the lights come on. I had been thinking that the Spirit was like this commodity that I could just get more of and put inside of me and boom! super Christian. No, he said. 
He wants more of you. And you need to be willing to let him examine your heart and put his finger on those things that you're still holding on to. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe it's just the plain old desire to have my own way. But it is the way of surrender that leads to the spirit-filled life. Because as we surrender our lives to him, we make room for him to live and to be who he desires to be in and through us. I'm excited about the journey that we are all going on together. And I, I say we just because you have reverend in front of your name does not mean that you are a healed, whole person. We're all on a journey of wholeness. And the starting place for us is to remember, I'm not a citizen of this world. I am a citizen of the kingdom. And I am a citizen of the kingdom because Jesus Christ has brought the kingdom to earth. And as I have died to myself and entered into a relationship with him, I have become a citizen. And as a citizen, one of the privileges I have is to be filled with his Holy Spirit, to be completely surrendered to his spirit that I might be healed and made whole. When Paul says to be filled with the spirit, it's not a one-off thing. If you were to translate that passage literally, it would say, be being filled with the Spirit. Keep on being filled. It, you know, the fact of the matter is we leak. We put the selfishness back in there and squeeze the Spirit out. It's a daily surrender to Him. The question I sometimes get is, well, Dan... What if I just don't want to? What if I kind of like my selfishness? I mean, yeah, it's causing me pain, and, but doggone it, there's some things I just don't want to let go of. What, what do I do when I don't want to? Well, that same professor I referred to earlier addressed that in a sermon he preached once in chapel. He said, when you don't want to, and when you can be honest enough to say to yourself and to God, I don't want to, the prayer for you is, Lord, give me grace to want to want to. Give me grace to want to want to. And throw yourself on his mercy. That's my prayer for each of you. That's my prayer for myself, that we'll want it. And when we don't want it, that we'll cry out for his mercy to want to want it. Let's pray together. Lord, it is by your grace and your grace alone that we are citizens of this kingdom. We certainly have not deserved it. We have not earned it. We never could. But through your great love and compassion and mercy, you have made the way open. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We join our hearts now praying you would give us grace to surrender ourselves to you. And all of those hurtful, angry, sinful, selfish parts that just want to own us, oh God, we surrender them to you. And we ask that each day you would give us grace to do that. And when we realize we don't want to, give us grace to want to want to. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.